The Sopranos television series is a truly legendary work that changed its viewers' perception of TV shows and, of course, changed people's perception of the American Mafia. Before that, the standard for gangster movies was The Godfather, with its theme of family and revenge. Then it was followed by Goodfellas, which showed a more mundane side of the Mafia lifestyle than was believed. And finally, in 1999, The Sopranos was released, at which point we saw that the drama and the gangster genre could be deeper and more versatile than in The Godfather, and that the realism and homeliness of Goodfellas was not at all the standard. The Sopranos set a new bar that very few people have approached so far. That's why this series has so many fans around the world, even so many years after its end. However, not all of them are aware that the Soprano family from the show had a real-life mafia counterpart called the De Cavalcante family that looked a hell of a lot like it. The show's creator, David Chase, has of course denied that he wrote The Sopranos in the image of the De Cavalcantes, but the many coincidences that have been brought up by members of that mafia family themselves point to his obvious guile. And if you are interested to hear who might have served as prototypes of the characters in your favorite series, what these prototypes were doing and how much similarity between reality and the series was true, then meet the real Sopranos on the other side of the law. New Jersey where the fictional and real-life Sopranos were from is well-deserving of a whole show to be made about it and its issues with local criminals, because it was here that several Mafia families were intertwined, starting from New York and ending down in Florida. And that's not counting the non-Italian gangs, which there were more than a few of from the Prohibition era. But today, we're not interested in them, but in the one local Mafia family now known as De Cavalcante. Actually, to be more precise, there were two local families in New Jersey for a while, one from Elizabeth Township and the other from Newark. Both were formed at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. Only one has stood the test of time. Elizabeth would eventually go to the De Cavalcantes, while Newark would fade into oblivion and its members would disperse to other Mafia families. This was due to the fact that in Newark in the 1930s, there were a number of conflicts that the family did not survive. First, then-family boss, Gaspare D'Amico, had a run-in with another mafioso named Vincent Troy. The latter had moved to Newark in those years and planned to settle there. Troy did so, apparently without D'Amico's approval, so Gaspare decided to get rid of his newfound insolent neighbor. In August 1935, a murder attempt was made on Troy, which he did not survive. Two years later, D'Amico himself also caught a bullet. The most likely scenario of the assassination attempt on him was a conflict with the New York family boss, Joe Profacci. Gaspare nevertheless survived, but then decided to resign as boss and leave Newark. Afterwards, the commission decided to dissolve the local family and its members dispersed to other clans. In case you didn't know, the commission is the mafia's body for deciding important issues in the US, consisting of the most powerful bosses in the country. You can learn more about it in my video about the birth of the American mafia. At the same time, literally a few dozen miles away in a much smaller town than Newark, Elizabeth quietly contained another Mafia family. It's not known who its first boss was, because in those years the organization played no particularly significant role. We can only say that the vast majority of its first members were natives of the Sicilian town Ribera, located in the province of Agrigento. The first known leader of the family named Filamari was also from there, and he became the boss in the 1920s. He ruled this borgata until 1958, then he resigned from his post and went to Italy to live out his life. He was replaced by Nick Del More, who was quite old himself and had to leave the boss's chair for health reasons in 1963, and was replaced by his nephew, Sam de Cavalcante, the same one the family is named in honor of to this day. 
De Cavalcante's reign is considered the family's golden age. It was under him that it reached its maximum influence and economic prosperity. There was even evidence that members of the New York Mafia wanted to go to De Cavalcante to improve their position. The real-life Sopranos were involved in all sorts of livelihoods back then. They had control of the New Jersey construction industry by running the local union. They were involved in gambling, betting, loan sharking, protection, and robbery. And during the sexual revolution of the 1960s, they even managed to enter the pornography trade. Closer to the 1980s, various types of health insurance fraud into the stock market would be added to that list. During Sam's era, the family was able to spread its interest from Connecticut to Pennsylvania and even partially entered New York. Likewise, de Cavalcante's reign is marked by the first evidence that the Borgata, his family unit, had influence over the local political system. Thus, Sam had ties to New Jersey Governor Richard Hughes and to Elizabeth Mayor Thomas Dunn. But de Cavalcante also made his mark on the negative side. He talked a great deal about the business in his office, which was bugged between 1961 and 1965. There were conversations about both the internal affairs of the family and the state of the mafia in the country overall. De Cavalcante was one of the intermediaries between Joe Bonanno and the commission, after Bonanno's failed attempt to seize power in the American mafia, which is also reflected in these recordings made by the authorities, as well as in my video about Bonanno which you can find on my channel. However, none of the recordings could directly serve the prosecutors because they were made without proper authorization, so de Cavalcante avoided a trial. But he went to jail anyway. It happened in 1971 when he got charged with organizing gambling with a total income of $20 million a year. Sam served two of his allotted five years. He had heart problems and the authorities gave him parole, recalling that he was well-behaved in prison. Apparently, this was also the reason why de Cavalcante stepped down as boss of the family, moving to Florida and leaving John Riggi, nicknamed the Eagle, in charge of the Borgata. Riggi was a hereditary mafioso. His father, Emmanuel, was close to Nick Del More and was also one of the family's top labor racketeers. John's rise began in the late 1950s when he came to the attention of de Cavalcante. In the 1960s, Sam promoted Riggi to captain and put him in charge of union racketeering, and when he got out of prison in 1973, he gave him the de facto boss's chair, which John had held since the beginning of de Cavalcante's prison term. Riggi continued to strengthen the family's authority, established by de Cavalcante and it must be said that he succeeded very well until the end of the 20th century, when the events that we'll discuss later would take place. Riggi's reign was the period in which the generation that became, in part, the inspiration for the Sopranos characters was on its way to its final formation. In 1990, John Riggi was jailed for 12 years on labor racketeering charges. He was not going to give up power and decided to run the family through trusted individuals, one of whom would eventually become Vincent Palermo, nicknamed Vinny Ocean. It's Palermo who's considered the main candidate suspected to be the prototype for Tony Soprano, so from now on, we'll lead our narrative about the real Sopranos through the lens of Vinny Ocean's fate. Palermo was born in 1944 in Brooklyn. He lost his father early, and by the end of the 1950s was forced to go to work to help his mother feed the family. So Vinny started at the Fulton Fish Market, which is where he got his nickname Ocean. This line of income, by the way, would remain with Palermo for most of his life, only instead of a salesman, he eventually became the owner of a fish store. In the early 1960s, Vinny met and soon married Sam de Cavalcante's niece, which became the jumping point for his rapprochement with the New Jersey family. Had this not happened, Palermo might well have become a member of one of the New York families too, since his brother Pasquale was a member of the Colombo family and his uncle was related to the Gambino family. 
But fate had it that in the late 1970s, Vinny Ocean was accepted into the Borgata of Di Cavalcante. What exactly he did in the period from his marriage to his initiation is unknown. In those days, Palermo was virtually a ghost to the authorities and remained so until the 90s. Evidence of his first serious crimes would come to the FBI only 10 years after they were committed. We're talking about several murders he committed on the orders of family boss John Riggi. The first victim was Fred Weiss. This guy was running a construction scam with people from the Gambino family. They bought up the land of an abandoned railroad station on Staten Island and turned it into an illegal dump. Soon enough, law enforcement became interested in the case, and they took Weiss, among others, into custody. Other offenses were discovered in addition to the dump, so Fred could be facing decades behind bars. Gambino boss John Gotti felt that Weiss could not be trusted that he could easily become a government witness, and decided he had to be taken out. And since Weiss also had dealings with the De Cavalcante family, the hit was decided to be a joint effort. Weiss had two homes. One was monitored by Team Gambino and the other by Team De Cavalcante, led by Vinny Ocean. Weiss ended up setting foot in New Jersey, and Palermo and his boys gunned him down. A year after the hit, John Riggi was arrested. He would remain the boss and run the family through John DeMato for the first time. The only problem here was that in addition to the Loyalist, there were some potential rebels on the loose, namely Luis Larasso, who had been an underboss during the Sam de Cavalcante era and didn't seem to mind regaining the position he'd lost when Riggi took over. So, in 1991, Riggi struck first. The team for the hit was once again led by Vinny Ocean. However, after Larasso's murder, the main supporter of the idea, John D'Amato, was also eliminated almost immediately. The official reason for this was suspicion of his homosexual tendencies. In 1991, D'Amato got himself a new girlfriend, to whom he revealed he was bisexual. She blabbed it to an acquaintance, who also turned out to be the gangster's girlfriend. And this rumor eventually reached the guys from De Cavalcante. The unofficial reason for taking out D'Amato was that he was very close to John Gotti, and it was getting to the point that if D'Amato stayed in power, the De Cavalcantes would sooner or later turn into a branch of the Gambino family, which many were not happy with. So the motive for murder being his homosexual tendencies was just right. Palermo was not involved in this hit, but helped to dispose of the body. I think those who are especially attentive already noticed that this real case in many ways overlaps with the story of Vito Spatafore from The Sopranos. And the life ending of someone who started running a family on the streets after D'Amato's murder is quite similar to the story of Jackie April. This guy's name was Jake Amari. In 1992, he became what's called a street boss. In 1995, he was diagnosed with stomach cancer, and in 97, he died from it. After Amari was diagnosed with cancer, he stepped aside, and a diarchy consisting of Vinny and Jimmy Palermo was put in charge of the family. If anything, they were just namesakes. But this situation did not suit another family member, named Charles Majuri. He first tried to convince boss John Riggi to put him in charge, and when he didn't get what he wanted, he decided to kill both the Palermos. However, he misjudged his hitman. Majuri assigned it to soldier Jimmy Gallo, who instead of pulling off the hit, told everything to Vinny Ocean. Afterward, Gallo was already sitting outside Majuri's house with a gun. In the end, the assassination attempts never happened on either side of the conflict, and the tension somehow died down on its own. It's not known why this happened, but neither Majuri nor Palermo tried to kill each other again and Vinny Ocean became the de facto main man of the De Cavalcante family. His life back then was similar to the one Chase showed in Tony Soprano. Wife, kids, luxurious home, and excellent income. Except there were no psychological problems. Palermo had a cut of the family's betting and loan sharking, engaged in labor racketeering, and organized gambling on a yacht in neutral waters. 
participated in stock exchange fraud by pumping junk stock through unscrupulous brokers and dumping it at maximum price, and he tried to engage in legitimate businesses as much as possible. This included the previously mentioned fish store as well as the Wiggles strip club. He also made a deal with Siemens to distribute their cell phones to Russia and planned to expand in the nightclub sphere in cooperation with Bob Guccione, the creator and owner of one of the most popular erotic magazines in the world, Penthouse. Incidentally, Wiggles is another Palermo match to Tony Soprano, who also owned a strip club, only with the name Bada Bing. In reality, however, Wiggles was a much more famous establishment than Bada Bing and was located not in New Jersey but in New York. It didn't have to do with any innovations or elite service, but because of the constant hype and scandals surrounding the club. At first, residents living near the club complained about it and even held picket protests several times. And then the mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, decided to close it, citing the law that such an institution should be at a certain distance from schools and churches. Because of this, Wiggles opened and closed constantly making headlines in television news, and its representatives spent dozens of hours in court. The main stumbling block in the law that the parties argued over was the 60-40 rule. To summarize, a club was an erotic club only if more than 40% of its space was used for the sale of erotica or erotic services, and the rest was other kinds of establishments. Vinnie Ocean had clearly delineated the required area and fenced it off from the rest of the club, which allowed it to continually reopen, even though undercover agents were repeatedly caught violating this rule. Yes, you heard me right. There were special agents who would come to the strip joint and see if a girl would dance for them outside of the regulated area. And the money to pay the strippers, of course, came out of the state treasury. It was a dream job. In fact, the 90s were a golden era for Vinnie Ocean. The money flowed, the power in the family was in his hands, at least until John Riggie's release in the early 21st century, and the FBI did not even guess at his role in the American Mafia. Soon enough, though, the De Cavalcante family would have its own big pussy Bon Pensiero, who would go much farther than his show prototype. Ralph Guarino had never been a member of the De Cavalcante family, but regardless, he was to become the man who would gather the evidence that allowed authorities to arrest several dozen people connected to De Cavalcante. But don't think that before his work for the government, Guarino was not already famous. He had one of the most ingenious and daring robberies in the history of New York under his belt although it was not performed by the most intelligent robbers, which makes it impressive not only for its planning, but also for the stupidity of its enactors. The gist of the case was as follows. Guarino knew a guy who worked at that World Trade Center. You know, the one that took the big slam in September of we all know what year. It's better not to even mention it on YouTube. This acquaintance told him that on the same day and at the same time, money was being brought into the Bank of America branch in that center. Several security guards with bags would take a freight elevator up to the 11th floor and hand the money to the branch. Upon hearing this story, Guarino immediately put together a seemingly perfect plan in his head. First, he talked an acquaintance who was the building's maintenance supervisor into getting some passes so the robbers could get in. Then these guys were to meet two security guards with money near the freight elevator, disarm them, transfer the money into gym bags, and walk out the front door, blending in with the crowd. On the one hand, this idea felt like suicide. The building in question had probably the largest concentration of police in New York. There were New York City cops, New York and New Jersey Port Authority cops, and federal police officers. Plus, inside the center were offices for the U.S. Secret Service, Customs Protection, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. On the other hand, because of this, few would have thought that there would be daredevils willing to break in and rob Bank of America collectors. 
Garino was counting on this element of surprise. Only the perpetrators he picked were terrible. They were small-time gangsters and drug addicts Richie Gillette, Melvin Folk, and Mike Reed, who agreed to join in for $20,000. It all happened in January 1998. These geniuses entered the building, passed through the barriers to the service area without any problems, and went up to the right floor. There, they put on ski masks, took out pistols, and started waiting for the collectors. As soon as the elevator doors opened, they disarmed them, filled their gym bags with money, and then successfully left the building. Seems like a success, you might think. It wasn't, though, because for one, they took foreign currency. Dollars were at the bottom of the bags, and on top were francs, yen, lira, and other non-Ben Franklin paper. But that was only half the trouble. These geniuses of criminal ideation walked to the elevator with open faces, which they didn't even bother to cover with as much as their hoods, and they also walked with the money from the elevator with their heads proudly raised, allowing their faces to be shown on more than 50 video cameras. Of course, they were caught almost immediately and forced to hand over the mastermind of the robbery. Guarino was facing about 20 years in prison, but the FBI offered him another option. They knew that Ralph had connections with people from the Decavorcante Mafia family and that some of them were supposed to help him get rid of foreign currency. The agents wanted Ralph to get close to them and become a secret informant. So began Guarino's work for the government. The first person Ralph spoke to after putting on a mic was Tommy de Tora, a partner in the de Cavalcante family. The conversation centered mainly on Garino persuading de Tora to talk to Vinny Ocean about marketing the foreign currency he'd recently stolen. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. When Garino was recruited, the FBI had no idea who Vincent Palermo was. All he had on his record was stealing shrimp years ago. It wasn't until Ralph labeled Ocean as de Cavalcante's main man on the streets that the Bureau made him a key target for the operation. Garino's transaction was eventually turned down, citing Palermo's reluctance to get involved with a case that had been talked about so much on TV and was still under notice. One of the main reasons why the mafioso let the guy near him, in addition to his reliability and reputation, was, of course, his ability to turn a profit which Ralph perfectly demonstrated with his robbery. Garino began spending a lot of time with a guy named Joe Masella, who was an associate of Vinny Ocean. He worked as his driver for a while and then worked on collecting the payoffs Palermo received from his various illegal businesses. Ralph rode along with Masella practically around the clock, taping everything he said. And Joe talked a lot. Sometimes he drove Palermo, who considered Guarino a reliable man and was not shy about talking business. The only problem he had with Masella was his gambling addiction. Not only did he owe almost every New York family, but he also began stealing from Palermo to cover some of his debts and gamble again. For example, he told Ocean that the loan shark was raising his rate by 1%. Vinny in turn made no fuss about it, and Joe took the difference for himself. Of course, Palermo found out about this and decided that the benefit of Masella was not worth the trouble he was causing. So, Joe was killed and Ralph came under the wing of Joseph Sclafani, who talked just as much as Masella. Moreover, Sclafani liked Gorino so much that he promised to recommend him for admission into the family. However, as was the case with Donnie Brasco, who I have a separate video about on my channel, Garino was pulled out before he could become a member of the Mafia. By the summer of 1999, almost a year after Ralph first went out on the street with a wire, the de Cavalcantes learned that there was a rat in their ranks. Total paranoia set in. Everyone was trying to find the snitch, leading to several murders. And the FBI finally decided that Garino had to be pulled out or they'd get him sooner or later. Ralph was taken off the streets at the end of 1999, and already on December 2nd of the same year, there was a simultaneous mass arrest of 40 people associated with De Cavalcante. More than a few mobsters from this group opted to switch sides, including Vincent Palermo. 
Ocean faced spending the rest of his life in prison, as the other guy had told about all his affairs, mentioning all the murders he committed. As a result of Palermo's and other defected mobsters' testimonies, a couple dozen more people were arrested, the total number of which exceeded 60, and a sixth of them became government witnesses. And so, the authorities managed to imprison almost all the high-ranking members of the De Cavalcante family, including an extended sentence for John Riggi, who was already in prison. Vincent Palermo, on the other hand, served two years, and upon his release went into the witness protection program. His new identity was revealed in the late noughties. His name is now Vincent Cabela, and he resides in Houston where he owns several strip clubs. He was linked to drug trafficking and money laundering, but they couldn't prove anything. So, Vinny Ocean is still at large. The De Cavalcante family, on the other hand, has fallen apart since the event. This is well illustrated by the fact that the family's street boss, Frank Gorassi, was personally involved in extorting money from a pizzeria in 2009. The real boss, John Riggi, who was still in jail at the time, was obviously very sad remembering the power and influence that the Mafia had just a few decades before. Clearly, we can't claim a full-fledged copying of Tony Soprano from Vinnie Ocean. Chase's characters correspond to the addition of his own creative ideas, but you can't prove it to the fans of the series. They immediately began to look for parallels with reality, which, to give credit, often turned out to be quite convincing. The main one, of course, is Tony Soprano and Vincent Palermo. Big house, big family, strip club, boss of the family while the authorities were stuck on another, and good relations with New York families. Also cited as a prototype for Tony is John Riggi, but there are far fewer coincidences here, the main one being that they're more similar in appearance. Chase also mentioned that the Genovese faction in New Jersey was used to create the Sopranos, so in theory, there could be a piece of Richie Boyardo in Tony Soprano. For example, covering up his illegal dealings under the legal occupation of waste dumping and recycling. Next, let's remember the already mentioned John D'Amato, who matches his gay tendencies with Vito Spadafore, and Jay Camari, who died of cancer just like Jackie Aprile. Salvatore Bonpensiero, nicknamed Big Pussy, had matches with several real-life gangsters at once. The first was Ralph Gorino, who, just like Bonpensiero, cooperated with the authorities and wore a wire. The second is Anthony Russo, from whom Bonpensiero's nickname was apparently taken. Russo was the only known mobster within the confines of New York and New Jersey who had Pussy as part of his nickname. Pauli Galtieri, for his part, was inspired by members of the De Cavalcante family themselves, who were caught on the wire discussing the first season of The Sopranos. They believed that Pauli was based on De Cavalcante captain Gaetano Vastola, who was also a big muscular guy similar in demeanor to Galtieri. Hesh Rabkin most resembles Morris Levy, a famous music producer who was involved with the Mafia. The rest of the characters in the show either don't have real-life prototypes or they're heavily drawn from the real world, such as the comparison between Johnny Sack and John Gotti, or the even stranger parallel between Junior Soprano and Peter Gotti, which to me is completely incomprehensible. The parallels between the series and reality don't end there, however. Satriale's Pork Store also existed, only it was called Sacco's and was owned by a member of the De Cavalcante family. Joseph Giacobbe, who used it as a headquarters for his crew. Chase was not shy about using real-life scams in the plot that were really done by the Mafia. For example, John Gotti Jr. was tried in 1998 for the phone card scam that Big Pussy tells Furio about. At the same trial, a whole new gangster scheme was uncovered, which almost immediately found its reflection in the series. This was the time where Tony Soprano paid money to a black activist for organizing riots at a construction site under the guise of dissatisfaction with working conditions for blacks. In reality, the riots and strikes were only necessary so that the mobsters could extort money from the developers in order to quietly continue their work. 
Another similar case of using a real crime in the series was the airline ticket scam, engaged by Tony Soprano. This was tied to Stephen Kaplan's case, who got tried for it in 1999. And remember, in the show, a Tony ran card games at a Hasidic Jewish hotel. The real-life partner of the DeCavalcante family did the same thing. However, true crime and the TV show not only had parallels, they overlapped. Prior to the release of The Sopranos, the main movie for mobsters about themselves was The Godfather. The gangsters were eager to get acquainted with actors from the movie. In particular, it's a well-known fact that James Caan had friendly relations with quite a few gangsters. So when The Sopranos came out on screens, the same fate befell its actors. They were often seen in places of business with the mafia, and some would see it as inevitable, while others would say it was in their favor. For example, actors Tony Sirico and Vincent Pastore were friends with Colombo family capo James Clemenza. Though in Sirico's case, it's not surprising. As a young man, he was associated with the Colombo crime family, had 28 arrests, and even served time in prison. However, he was not the only one who walked a crooked path among the actors of the series. For example, Tony Borghese, who played Larry Borghese, knew John Gotti and Paul Vario in his youth, and in 2011 was convicted for hiring people connected with the Gambino family to extract a debt from a guy who hadn't paid it. Michael Squicciarini, who played Frank Cipollina, also spent many years in prison, five of them for aggravated assault. And after his death in 2001, he was charged with the murder of a Hispanic drug dealer. As for Frank Valanga, the actor who played Carmine Lupertazzi, although he wasn't in prison, he worked for a long time in the famous mafia club Copacabana. To my surprise, he was also the inspiration for one of the main characters in the movie Green Book, as it was Frank who accompanied the black musician Don Shirley in his tour through some racist states. Also notable were Vincent Pistore, who played Big Pussy and was charged with beating up his girlfriend, John Ventimiglia, who played Artie Bucco and was arrested for DUI, Lilo Brancato Jr., who played Matthew Bevilacqua and was first arrested for drug possession and then went to jail for 10 years for attempted robbery, resulting in the death of a police officer, and even Robert Eiler, who played the role of Anthony Jr. and got three years probation for attempted robbery. If I missed anyone, let me know in the comments, as there were so many mob-connected or just law-breaking guys in The Sopranos that I'm sure I left someone out, so I hope you can help. The Sopranos is undoubtedly the best series about the American Mafia and one of the best crime dramas, so it's not surprising that this work largely echoes real events and people. Because, as we know, life is the best screenwriter.